Good morning, trucked up guys and gals. I have been waiting for this moment for quite a while. It is the launch of our inaugural BC wide trucked up stop tour. I'm looking forward to this trip. I've heard a lot about how in certain parts it's really difficult to travel long distances with an EV truck. Most people who are buying the F-150 Lightning version of an EV truck are buying the extended range. Well, I've got the tiniest battery you can get in an electric truck today. So I thought, hey, why don't we just go find out and just drive all over the bloody place and we'll go from rural to urban to all stops in between and just see what the heck happens. See if I get myself in trouble and then everyone else can get a good idea of what to expect if you go on the road with an electric truck. Here we are at my favorite stop in Castlegar at Common Grounds Coffee. Basically, this is where I always fuel up with my go-go juice every morning. And what's really cool about it is I'm literally one or two blocks just down the road here from all of the superchargers, Tesla, Flow, Chevron, BC Hydro, very conveniently located. Well, we're starting off our trip. We've driven 24.6 kilometers. I have a 386 kilometer EPA estimated range for this truck. And I charged up this morning and you can see that that is so far beyond 386 kilometers. I've got 407 kilometers remaining. So you can do the math and that's probably gonna increase, not decrease. We'll see how today goes. What about rural areas, tiny little villages, tiny little towns, huge distances between each one? What's the case then as we drive across BC doing our trucked up stops? Well, let's check out a couple en route to our next trucked up stop and see what they got. Here we are in the village of New Denver, population around 350, 450 on a good day. And guess what? In this tiny little village, about 100 kilometers from our original destination, and we have a DC fast charger, one at 100 kilowatts and one at 50 kilowatts. 50 kilowatts is pretty slow. 100 kilowatts, you're doing fine with most vehicles. Nice top up as you're heading through the mountains. So basically, you've got no problem cruising through these mountain passes uh, because there's charges everywhere. So let's keep going. We have arrived at our first trucked up stop here in the cusp British Columbia that borders Arrow Lakes. A beautiful garden town, the main streets done in beautiful gardens and all down by the waterfront is absolutely gorgeous with flowers and walking areas. One of my favorite little towns and we're gonna pop over to Mountaintop Coffee and see if we can get a little trucked up with some local folk. So here's a couple of great questions that I heard here in the cusp. Two lovely ladies who walked away with a couple of trucked up t-shirts. What's up with the batteries? Like they're super, super expensive. And we hear all these things about fires. How reliable are they? Here it is with the Ford F-150 Lightning that I own. I have a regular standard range warranty on those batteries that I believe is eight years, 160,000 kilometers. That's a long time to be covered, much longer than any internal combustion engine. The other thing is some of the designs are incorporating efficiencies in production, but they're not so efficient after you buy the vehicle. With the Tesla structural battery pack, it's one glued mass. If something goes wrong with a small number of those batteries, you gotta replace the whole pack. And yes, another question that came up was, how much are those battery packs? I keep hearing how expensive they are, said one of the, the women. And I said, yeah, they actually are uh, very expensive. They can be $40,000 to replace these things. However, Ford created modular battery packs. This is brilliant because if you do have an issue, you just change one module. So I could drive 200,000 kilometers or a hundred and whatever that is in miles, I'll put it down below afterwards, and then have a battery issue and I can replace just the modules where those issues are ha happening and drive another 200,000 kilometers. Reliability, well, 
again, the thing that came up is a lot of the fear that we keep hearing that media is really pumped out on EV trucks. And I've heard it twice today. I heard it once in Castlegar, and I heard it once in the cusp. And that was regarding fires. And the reality is you're eight times more likely to have a gasoline fire than you are an EV fire. And that's not based on, you know, raw numbers of how many vehicles are out there. That's percentage. So your risk is much higher in a gas vehicle than it is in an electric vehicle. One more came up and I loved it. It was from Molly. Thank you, Molly, for the question for a gentleman named Ray Nickel, who has the gardening business out here in the cusp and all the beautiful gardens that you see out here. He takes care of them. And Molly, uh, thought, well, why don't we get Ray Nickel into one of these things? And he's like, well, man, we could never afford one. There's not a lot of used, there's almost no EV trucks out there that are used because they're brand new on the market. In fact, most of them haven't even made it to market yet. But if you're going to get a, a, a new EV truck, in the case of mine, for example, I bought it for less than buying a V8 XLT of the same trim and same year. So the prices have come way down. I think we're still going to see that first adopter phenomena with the Silverado EV. There's going to be a lot of demand up front for them so they can keep the prices high. We've seen that with Cybertruck. Absolutely insane prices for these things with all kinds of bugs, but people are willing to pay. Those prices are going to come down significantly. Let's go find some more questions from some folk in the Okanagan. Well, we're in a little tiny village ferry crossing Arrow Lakes. It's a free ferry, it's just first come, first serve, but it's very fast, very nice. I love how you can see the little bottom one right there, 137K, 262 is my current range. That 137 is telling me how much distance I have until I get to my destination in Vernon. It shows ferry 200 meters ahead, and it's giving me all the information for my destination on screen here, including my arrival time, which shows me a tiny bit late for my next trucked up stop. So hmm, we'll see how that goes. But overall, it's very cool how much information comes up on the screen for me as I go. What's also very cool is at this tiny little ferry in near an unincorporated village of Fokier is two BC Hydro DC fast chargers. So we're only about 35, 40 kilometers from the cusp that we just left. And yet again, another fast charger available if you need it. Pretty darn cool. It's been an absolutely fantastic drive, but hot, holy smokes, we're currently at 39 degrees Celsius. So I'll, I'll give the exact number down below. I'm thinking it's well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And my surprise is I thought that the, the two electric motors and the battery pack would have to use a lot more energy managing the cooling of those two items as these temperatures got up so high. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll definitely cut into range now. I've done now three major mountain passes, and it's, like I said, incredibly hot outside. So it's kind of a surprise when I look down, I see my temperature of my batteries is right in the middle. Temperature of my uh, motors is right in the middle, which is awesome having that information right in front of me as I drive. But what's really crazy is my range has gone up again. So if there's anything I'm learning since I bought this truck, is how much further I can go, not how much more my range is limited. So it's kind of the opposite of what I expected, is in the summer, I just keep getting way better range than I bargained for. So I could have literally driven from Castlegar when we set out 330 kilometers ago and driven all the way, well over 400 kilometer distance from one point to the next 
and I'm going to have 120, 130 kilometers remaining. When I topped up, it gave me an additional 51 kilometers of range, so I could have easily have made it with extra, uh, not even getting into kind of the orange zone. So I, I'm just so happy about what I keep discovering on these kind of journeys. And I'll tell you, it is absolutely magnificent out. Cameras don't do it any justice. I've gone through three different zones. So I've come from inland temperate rainforest. Castlegar is on the tip of that. It's kind of more ponderosa pine type stuff. Driving back into the inland temperate rainforest, then coming over the pass of the Monashies towards Vernon, and now coming down into these beautiful fields, highly productive. And as we get deeper and deeper down into the Okanagan Valley, it, we, you enter this massive fruit belt, very hot, lots of uh, access to water, however, and just a perfect growing environment for all of your orchards. Well, we've arrived at Davison Farmhouse Cafe. Awesome spot, orchard, farm, you name it. Gonna have a good time eating with the people here. It is 40 degrees Celsius and rising. It's a hot one. Time to hydrate. Well, we had one person brave the heat today. One. Uh, uh, I'm so impressed that they did because it is 43 degrees out here and rising. So we're going to call it quits here in Vernon. Uh, it's definitely not somewhere people want to be up at the top here. Uh, in fact, the little location that I'm at, the farm and so on, has almost no one turning out here in the heat. Very smart. They are in the lake here in Okanagan, swimming or in air-conditioned restaurants, pubs or cafes. For good reason, I was sitting next to my lightning for the one person who came by and very appreciative, by the way. Thank you, Darren. Uh, but my shoes started sticking to the asphalt. That's, that's never good. I'm going to jump in my truck. I'm going to bail. I'm going to be a wimp. Here's the thing about Vernon. So Vernon's a city, and it's such a surprise to have come from all these smaller cities and rural zones into Vernon. And they do have... Uh, charging stations about seven different locations all within you know about uh, five or six blocks of one another and almost every single one of them is in the crappiest location you can think of for example one of the BC hydro units is on the opposite way of a one-way down a back alley next to a bus only street good luck trying to get to it I was waved down by the bus patron saying hey Hey, dumbass, you're driving the wrong way! Because, well, I was. Thank you to them for letting me know I was uh, basically going to cause a traffic accident. After a couple of blocks of swinging around like a yo-yo, I finally found my way to the chargers, only to discover that every single DC fast charger in the city of Vernon is 50 kilowatts. So after 25 minutes and only getting 50 kilometers of range, uh, because it's so hot, it's having to spend a lot of time cooling the batteries down. So I got from uh, doing all that. So I'm actually going to Kelowna, 40 kilometers away, where DC fast chargers over 150 kilowatts are dime a dozen. But in the second big city of Vernon, I guess they just decided if you have an EV living there, you shouldn't. You should move to Kelowna. I, I don't know. If you're planning on traveling to the Okanagan, skip Vernon if you're driving an EV. They're door knob of fours. Oh, look, I'm getting passed by Teslas. Been passed by about five Teslas. Been passed by a whole bunch of Ionics. Uh, I've uh, been cruising along with a few F-150 Lightnings, and everybody's going to Kelowna. Ah, uh, city life. I forgot what this was like. I could bicycle ride faster. We are in Kelowna. You can hear by the background. Oh yeah, busy place. And we are charging at Chevron's DC fast chargers, 150 kilowatt. It's currently 45 degrees. Meanwhile, on the news, they're reporting, do not go outside. Stay in an air conditioned area. Please hydrate, keep yourself cool. But where the DC fast chargers are in Vernon, they're uncovered. There's no canopy, there's no seating area, there's no amenities whatsoever. You're gonna walk eight to 10 blocks, have your shoes melt, 
and uh, basically cook. When you can actually fry bacon on the hood of your vehicle, I don't think it's a good idea to go outside. Just me, could be wrong, could be quite balmy, might get yourself a nice tan, might be a little brittle when you're done. All across BC, you can go anywhere in BC. But as soon as you go southern BC or on the main routes, I'll tell you, everybody out here owns Teslas and there's a reason for that. Because Tesla superchargers are everywhere. So if you have that network and then all these other networks in your, in your stable for what you're gonna do, you got no problem traveling all over this province and having a good time doing it, never having to think about it any more than you would sticking a nozzle in your tank and filling up with gas or diesel. Because what are you gonna do when you fill up over there? You're gonna get out of your vehicle, you're gonna go inside, you're gonna buy yourself a Slurpee or, 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 or a sandwich or something else, and then you're gonna come back out and then you're gonna get in your vehicle. Well, that whole time, your vehicle was not filling. You'd already filled it, you went inside. But the entire process is taking you 10 minutes anyway. Well, I'm gonna be uh, about 20 minutes. So I'm gonna go inside, take a pee, and I'm gonna go get myself a whole bunch of crappy stuff that I shouldn't eat because by God, I've earned it. We're here at Kakuli Bay Campgrounds. Uh, it is still hot. I am probably gonna try something new, which will be kind of fun for the trip. So I've got a tent, but it's kind of like wrapping yourself in saran wrap and then going into a sauna. It's about 30, high 30s. So we're still in the 90s, easily in the 90s. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really wanna get inside a tent. And I don't really want to have a sleeping bag. So I figure, what a great time to see what it is like to sleep in a Lightning, use a Lightning as a camper. What I'm going to do as well is I'm going to uh, have the truck on all night long with the air conditioning running at about 23 degrees uh, Celsius, 24 degrees Celsius, so in the low 70s. And everything else will be turned off, but it'll have climate control on. Truck will run all night long, and we'll see how we do overnight. And the cool thing is, you can easily sleep in the back of this thing. So let's go take a look how much room is actually in this thing. I think you're going to be quite impressed. Come this way. So let's take a look inside, shall we? I basically just folded down the chairs. And holy smokes, you've got basically a full bed. Might have to turn the feed a little bit, but I don't think I will. I'm, uh, I was six feet, but I'm getting old. I mean, does anyone tell you about gravity? Does anyone warn you what happens as you age? No, nobody's that kind. Did anybody tell me? This is your physician. And we'd like to let you know that as you age, you shrink. Oh, no, 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 I was 5'11 and a half. You're 5'9 now. Uh, we're gonna wake up in the morning and I'll let you know whether I have a battery. I got a funny feeling it's barely gonna touch the darn thing. We're gonna see how we do. We've got about 75% of the battery left and I'll let you know in the morning. Well, good morning, trucked up guys and gals. I tell you, it was not the best of sleeps, but I won't blame it on the truck. I ran the, uh, the air conditioning for about two hours and I lost about three kilometers worth of range. So I went from 251 down to 248. I could have gone all night, no problem at all. Brought me down to maybe 240 from, you know, 251. So that wasn't gonna be a problem at all. But I noticed something else. The compressor for the air conditioning, the fan running, and then the pumps for glycol uh, would run. And my concern was more for the neighbors. I don't know if you've ever been parked next to a vehicle that runs generators all night, but that's noisy. So I thought, you know what, this is not fair to the tenting community in the area. So I'm not going to run this thing past a certain time. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to turn it off. It was still pretty hot, but I thought I'll just roll down the windows. It is cooling off. Well, the noise above where I'm camping, the highways only, uh, it's not that far away. And being in near two cities, it just runs all night long. 
and then the people racing up and down the highways all night long. For a guy who's used to living in the middle of nowhere, it's pretty noisy. It's about 5.45 in the morning, and I'm just going to get on with the day. If I was remotely camping somewhere else or just sleeping over in the truck and I wasn't worried about the, the compressor uh, for neighbors, then I would just do that all night, no problem at all. So there you have it. Let's get on the road. Well, we're in Kelowna. There's lots of superchargers everywhere. We are at the Canadian version of Electrify America, Electrify Canada. And they've got a couple of Ultras. I'm charging on the Ultra at 150 kilowatt. Now keep in mind, my truck can only do 155 kilowatt anyway. Over here, this is for, this is what we're starting to see more of in our urban centers. We need more of this right across the country, 350 kilowatt hyper fast now my truck couldn't use this anyway for any benefit um it would probably charge totally at peak at the 155 but we're getting to the point this is where you're going to bring hyundai and tesla and porsche and uh, a lot of new vehicles coming off the market are able to charge at 350 kilowatt and we're going to see a lot more of that and holy smokes at 350 kilowatt hey <laughs> you're charging almost as fast as you will to fuel up with gas or diesel and go in and you know, pay up and come back. That's getting to where we need to be. Okay, off to my first trucked up stop here in Kelowna. I came here a lot when I was younger and it's amazing how developed it is. This used to all be orchards and rolling hills and now it's just fully developed in every direction. Man, it has become a mecca, has the Okanagan Valley for sure. And for some, it's got everything. It's kind of like California and Canada, you know? It's always sunny, there's water everywhere, there's always something to do. A lot of people just love that environment, and I appreciate that. But man, the congestion and the noise. When you've lived outside of that, you realize how fortunate you are and how much that can affect people with stress levels and anger. Man, I haven't seen so many middle fingers and people hanging out of windows angry. Of course, it's, you know, going on 40 degrees again for today. So that'll make people a little, you know, but uh, yeah, uh, not my cup of tea. I like being in the middle of nowhere. Just me, I guess. To each their own. I've left Kelowna past Penticton. I'm heading south down towards the U.S. border and the city of Osoyoos. We're going to turn off before we get there. I didn't have anyone show up at either of the trucked up stops. No surprise. I knew I was pushing my luck a little bit. I mean, arriving on a weekday just after the hours where work starts, eh, you're not going to have a lot of people show up. 70% of my subscribers are from the US, Australia, and Europe. About 30% are Canada, but you do the math with 1,500 subscribers. I'm thrilled, thanks to all the folk who did join into conversations. If you do come out to one of these events, it's okay if you don't wanna be photographed or filmed. I get it. We're turning off of 97 South, and we're taking the connector from Penticton to Karameas, Highway 3A over the pass. It's a different landscape, but you can see how it starts to change from what we've been driving through before. Now this is what the Okanagan really looked like. It's just all orchards, vineyards, and wild zones, rolling hills, untouched. It's quite beautiful. So the valleys are really developed in here with a lot of organic, fresh produce, as well as the orchards. You can basically buy anything you can grow right here in Kirameas. Just makes me want to come here and stuff my face on peaches and cherries and plums and mm, 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 right off the vine. Yeah, right off the tree. Just absolutely love that idea. But I'm a little early. Darn it. Have to come back. Well, here is Bear's homegrown fruit and vegetables. And it turns out there might just be some peaches and cherries after all. We're gonna go have to check it out. What's really cool about it is what they mean by homegrown. Because what's inside here is grown right over there. Ever worry about where your food comes from? Not here. Through the Similkameen Valley, coming into the community of Karameas, You've got to basically do what the locals do, and that's enjoy 
the local harvest. You know what I'm having for lunch? I'll probably need to make a bit of a pit stop in a few hours when this, um, when this is all gone. Mm. Picked like yesterday off the tree, organic, rainier cherries. Oh, so good. But you've got to have something to wash down this connoisseur's dish. And thus, I have Twisted Hills craft cider, locally made from the local orchard, right here. Nice organic craft cider from their cidery. But it's soft cider, 0% alcohol, which means I can drink and drive. Now, of course, people come from all over the world to sample the vineyards and the wineries of the Okanagan and the Similkameen, true connoisseurs of some of the finest tastes in life, where they come and take little taste tests and smell and the bouquet of the wine and they swirl it and they sample it and they, yeah. <clears throat> I could really fit in here. Here I am in the village of Headley. This is a pretty unique little part of the world between Karameas and Princeton in the Similkameen, and it is in these wild uh, mountains. You can see behind me. What's really cool about Headley is it was part of the major gold rush. You can see a lot of the buildings here are turn of the last century, almost every one of them actually. What's even cooler is if we take a look up there, up at the very top of that mountain is the gold mine off the side of a cliff. It's quite something. So Headley's still going. Population here and surrounding areas, 242 people. And no, there's no DC fast chargers. There's no slow chargers. There's no chargers. But with a population in town of 150 odd people, and being that every single person owns a house, I imagine if anybody wanted to, they could just charge up at home. I love the fact that it's got this gold history and a lot of it's still standing. Let's take a look at some of the highlights of a gold rush town. There's the Stray Horse Hotel. And over here, down the street, is the saloon. The old general store and the hardware building down the road, all built turn of the last century. Here we are in Princeton, BC, population 2800. And we have two flow chargers right here. We see a nice Rivian R1T charging up at this one here. Of course, he's at this one because that one's 100 kilowatts. Still not exactly booming fast, but uh, faster than what's next to it. So of course, he's going to go for the one that's 100, as I would too, because I'm parked over at, oh yeah, the, uh, the 50 kilowatt. So guess what? In a town of 2,800 people, there are choices, which we're gonna go check out. Hey folks, again, keep in mind, Princeton has a population of 2,800 people, but it is on a major highway. And when it comes to major highways, that's where Tesla superchargers like to be. So here we are again, and we've got a series of Tesla superchargers all along here, which is fantastic. And keep in mind, they charge around 250 kilowatts, whereas you saw earlier, flow is at 50 and 100, and that's literally half a block away. Now again, you notice the real streamlined look of Tesla superchargers. That's because there's nothing there. That's just software underneath there, and they're running direct. All the hard work is being done right over here by these massive things. So this is where the heart and soul of the Tesla superchargers lies, is in these. And this is what a lot of companies don't want to invest in. So what they do is they put a whole bunch of batteries inside their charger and then they charge their charger. It's a lot cheaper because it's drawing electricity at a slower rate. So if you just run direct like Electrify Canada does, even Petro Canada, even though their systems never work, 
that's what they've done. So that way you can get a much higher rate of charge, but you pay for a lot of electricity up front off of that grid. Whereas with the battery charging types that are smaller, look like great fast things, 200 kilowatts, 150 kilowatts, but they're the worst system because they're only like that for several vehicles before they have to charge themselves back up, which means they get slower and slower and slower and they drain their level. And if you come in after a whole bunch of EVs and you charge up, you're gonna be charging at an incredibly slow rate. Here we are at option three in Princeton. Here we have it. You can hear the fan on this massive thing running behind me because it's trying to cool itself in this crazy hot weather. Uh, and basically when I take the CCS plug and I put it into the outlet, here we go, there should be a handshake that takes place right here. One, they click in and you should see it on the screen. So when I do that, there should be a little flashing light going on and it's not. What's even more interesting is this. So this is a 150 kilowatt, but the guy next to me is charging. So it's dropped its max power to 75. So we're moving on. This is no longer a fast charger we want to charge at. Two glitches. First one, my footage. All my Princeton footage has gone bye-bye. Now, my camera overheated a couple of times and actually shut down due to temperature problems. And I don't know if it affected anything, but basically, when I went to edit out my footage, my footage from Princeton to Vancouver had vanished. I'll fill you in. The Rivian left, I charged it flow, got 100 kilowatts, finished up, went for a walk in a beautiful park, took you with me, got a lot of nice footage. It was my first break on the trip where I had a little window of time. Uh, it's all gone. And then I got back to Princeton Municipal Campground. And this brings us to issue number two. There's an interesting thing about Princeton. Princeton has some of the lowest real estate values in, in, in Western Canada. And I always wondered why. I no longer wonder why. The reason that Princeton has one of the lowest uh, real estate values is because right in the center of the town is a mill. And that mill is some kind of grinding uh, lumber thing that runs all night long. And it's a metal grinding noise and a rumble, but it echoes through the ground. So if you're lying, I set up my tent and I laid down on my tent and I could hear the rumbling through the ground in my body and my ears against my pillow. It, you know when they have a, a war zone and they want to weaken the enemy and they instigate sleep deprivation and they play blasting music and horrible noises to force the opposing side to stay awake? That's Princeton. Needless to say, I was getting no sleep and about one o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, I moved everything back over to my truck and this time I had the air conditioning on all night and I woke up and it was wonderful and my great glorious, I don't know, four hours of sleep. The drive over from Princeton, it's called the Princeton Hope Highway. The famous Hope Slide happened there. That was an easy drive cruising all the way and getting myself to Vancouver. As soon as you're on the lower mainland, there's just chargers everywhere. It was a smooth sail. I had an absolutely awesome time in Vancouver and Port Moody and got together uh, for a coffee at Grit Coffee this morning for a trucked up stop. Of course, <laughs> Grit Coffee was closed. Oh yeah, um, opened I thought at seven. According to the website, I must have boo-booed something because it opens at nine. So anyway, people still braved it. I wanna thank uh, Ted for hanging around anyway and putting up with me picking a closed coffee shop for a meeting place. Ted, it was great. Ted's a Lightning owner himself. And Ted is a Canadian veteran. I wanna thank you, Ted, for your service and for Mike coming out, for both of you coming out to have a coffee where you couldn't, uh, couldn't have a coffee. Anyway, we're off to hope because I hope to see more folk in hope. Folk and hope. Folk and that sounds Scandinavian. But I'm off to see the folk and hope. Anyway, but there is the process of getting to hope. We're coming out of Coquitlam, down Highway 7, connecting to the Trans Canada, and we're gonna head right out of town over the beautiful Portman Bridge. And then the issues can start. Once you get over Portman Bridge, the challenge is actually getting to hope because usually somewhere between there and Abbotsford, it becomes a 10 kilometer, six mile long parking lot. So I'm hoping that today, fortune is on our side. 
the traffic is backed up as far as the eye can see all the way down the Trans Canada leading towards Hope. It's looking like I might be a little late. It's become kind of a regular thing trying to get around Vancouver. There's uh, there's like three million people crammed into a small little area where they're trying to make vast improvements to public transit and access HOV lanes. It's pretty impressive actually, but you just got so many people and then there's so many people coming through the area. Um, the ferries also come over from um, from Vancouver Island here. So you've got all the Vancouver Island traffic. You've got all the tourism. You've got everybody coming up from the U.S. You've got a lot of freight moving through to the ports. So it's a pretty busy place. But we're leaving Vancouver, heading for Hope, and it's backed up for several kilometers, according to good old Mr. Google. We're going to have to just take our chances, hope for the best, and hopefully we arrive in Hope before everyone leaves. We'll see how it goes. We're cruising through the Fraser Valley and uh, just, of course, leaving uh, Greater Vancouver and heading back into the coastal mountains. And we're about uh, 12 minutes from Hope. Uh, it's been a great drive, thanks to Mr. Google stepping in for us. Uh, looked like there was no way I was gonna make it on time. And then it decided, well, there's some construction going on on the Trans-Canada Highway. Here, I'll detour you and saved me about 10 minutes. So thank you to the wonderful world of AI technology stepping in uh, and outdoing humans yet once again. Boy, is that getting scary. But let's not go there. We're almost in hope. Let's get it on. Well, this is a bit of a surprise. If you recall, I wasn't exactly happy with a lot of Ford's adaptive cruise control. If you haven't seen my video on that little escapade, you can check it out right here. But as you can see, I currently have my hands off the wheel, not supposed to for any great deal of time, but I'm using adaptive cruise control now quite a lot. And I found that once you let the vehicle steer, right now I'm in lane keep assist, and I've got adaptive cruise control on, and it's actually, again, speaking of AI, it's doing better than human response as far as spacing myself between other vehicles, slowing down and speeding up when appropriate. So if you're in a lot of traffic, it does a very good job of spacing you and doing all the work that you need to have done. It's doing a great job with lane keep assist. I'm actually really surprised how good it is. And now I've come to really trust it. But I thought, well, what's the point? If I've got my hands on the wheel anyway, why would I need this lane keep assist and all this adaptive cruise control? It takes a lot of stress away from driving, especially when you've got a lot of stop and go or you're on a major freeway and it keeps changing. You're going from 100, 110 kilometers an hour, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, suddenly down to 20 miles an hour because you get these congested zones. It's just constantly taking that stress away. It just does it all for you. Well, here we are in Hope. We're gonna just hang out for a little bit and uh, see if we've got anybody coming by for a trucked up stop. And then we're gonna be moving on. But before I do, we're gonna have some of this fine home restaurant pie. Yeah, I shouldn't, but I'm gonna. I had a great time in Hope. I didn't have pie, I was very good. I ate a falafel. Yeah, really uh, rich. Uh, but I met some awesome folk, gentleman and his wife uh, pulling a trailer, fifth wheel I believe, with a Duramax diesel 2020, uh, awesome truck, and I was so impressed with how knowledgeable he was about the Silverado EV and where EV trucks still need to go, but how close they're getting. So that was an awesome conversation. Then I met uh, Gary, and Gary, uh, we ended up <laughs> with a lineup. There was like four or five F-150 Lightnings all together. Uh, we uh, totally commandeered the Electrify Canada in Hope. And uh, Gary's got his own plumbing company and he uses that truck heavily for work. That's what it is, 10, 12 hours at a time. He was on a remote job site off grid and did the entire job 10, 12 hours, got back in his truck with like two or 3% of his charge used. That just gives you an idea of how useful these things are in a work setting. Very intrigued by his story. And also, 
what he discovered and all of the folks said the same thing those who had their f-150 lightning trucks there they all said the same thing their epa range whether standard or extended range was much higher than they had expected ford definitely gone really conservative with their numbers on the epa range it's better than what's forecast for example, Gary with the plumbing company, his estimated is 515 kilometers or 320 miles. He did 599. So exactly the same type of ratio as what I'm seeing with my truck. That's just great news for EV trucks overall. The good news is I've had a lot of folk in the past little while and it's been great today. The bad news is I've run out of trucked up t-shirts. I gave away a couple of dozen of them already and when I get to the next stops, anybody who's there who wants a t-shirt, they're getting one for free. And uh, that's in uh, Kamloops uh, is our next stop. And then in Revelstoke. But if you want to get one of these t-shirts and you want to get it for free, come on out to a trucked up stop event or appear in one of my videos or any time that we come in contact with one another, ask me for a t-shirt. I'll get you a trucked up EV t-shirt. If you're wanting to order one, it's coming. Soon you'll be able to get yourself a trucked up EV t-shirt. It's on the way, just a little bit more time. I'll make sure I put a link and a notification when that happens. And on that note, this is a tiny, tiny channel and it costs a lot to do these crazy trips and bring you the information that I'm bringing you. And I'm hoping that you can provide some support because uh, we're in a losing proposition right now, but we're gonna change that. But in the meantime, all and every piece of support helps. If you could spare a buck or two in the donation button below, that makes a massive difference. If you can support me on my flat tire and coffee fund, that's gonna buy me a couple coffees when I'm on the road. That's through Patreon, link is below. Please help me out, I really appreciate it. But like, subscribe, and notification regarding all my trucked up stop events and anything that I'm up to, that's the biggest thing of all and that really makes a difference for the channel that's the most important thing please click that like subscribe and notification icon and i thank you so much already for what you've done for this channel i did something kind of dumb remember when i was back at hope and i had all those f-150 lightnings together and one of the guys wanted to charge up and get going and he was pretty low and i'd been at the charger not that long like 15 minutes and i was up to 80 percent and i thought yeah just let him in i said go ahead i'll just unplug go for it not really giving it any thought which is something i'm quite good at which was i have to go over the coquahalla pass the coquahalla pass in bc goes up a lot and not only does it go up a lot it goes up a lot fast at 120 kilometers an hour or 75 80 miles an hour so you're burning through some serious electrons over something like this <laughs> that wasn't very smart of me my destination right now to Kamloops is 136 kilometers away my truck is telling me that I have 157 kilometers of range I never cut things that close, never. In fact, the only time I had a little bit of, eh, call it range anxiety, not that it was really upsetting or, 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 or worry, but I was like, well, this is the closest I've ever come to that. And that was in my winter trek over five mountain passes across BC, yeah, right around Christmas and New Year's. And that video's right here. And I got down to a point where a little orange light came on and said, warning, you're getting a little low. That was it. I got to the charging station with about 45, 50 kilometers or 25, 30 miles to spare. So it was totally fine. This is the closest I've ever come. The good news is I've now got to the top of the pass. So I'm going down, but I'm still traveling at 75, 80 miles an hour or over 120 kilometers an hour. So with that said, I'm not getting the regen I typically would with something like this because I'm usually going a lot slower. Well, we're gonna find out one way or the other how we do. A Little bit of a surprise. I was all worried. I had my first little twinge of real range anxiety. Turns out I don't need to worry because it, I thought there were no major chargers between, because it's the Coquahal is like, there's kind of nothing for a long period of time. So I thought there's no way I'm gonna have any kind of DC fast charger between Hope 
and Kamloops. Well, it turns out that in the community of Merritt, they've got a hyper-fast charger with Electrify Canada and on the run with Chevron has a bunch of 200 kilowatt chargers. So I've got ultra-fast, fast chargers en route. So if I actually need it, I've got it. But I don't think I need to stop now because I've been going downhill more and I've been making fuel. I, I really like that. One hour later. Well, I did stupid item number two. I thought I'll be a little safe and I'll stop in Merritt, you know, just to be safe and top up a little bit. Well, for the first time in my life, it's kind of good that I stopped because I discovered my first EV traffic jam. Oh yeah, it seems that everybody this weekend had the same plan to come here to Merritt. And there was a lineup for the charging stations. And because a lot of people are going on long trips, have decided they don't want to charge to 80%, they want to charge to 100%. And the last 20%, as I've mentioned many, many times, takes longer than the first 80%. So you end up holding up everybody so you can get something that you actually don't need. So folks, if you decide to buy an EV, not an EV truck, any EV, charge to 80 or 85 percent because the chargers are frequent. But here's what happened. There was a major power problem in Hope and there was two or three chargers that I guess were down, including, I believe, could be wrong on this, the Tesla supercharger network. Something happened to the main trunk. So I guess there were issues with a lot of people in Hope. I didn't have any problems with the Electrify Canada, and I guess I just snuck under the wire with a whole bunch of other F-150 Lightning drivers, but everybody decided to go to the next stop. And of course, I didn't even know there was a next stop, and the next stop was Merritt. And there was a shit pile, an absolute slew fest of people in grumpy moods with EVs. But even with that said, they were all lining up for the fastest chargers. So I just drove down the street two kilometers and charged up at a 50 kilowatt BC Hydro fast charger that wasn't fast. And I had to wait for one other EV in front of me who was about 90% done. And we had a little happy chat and a good laugh. And I met a whole bunch of awesome people. And I was so sad that I couldn't give them t-shirts because I ran out. But anyway, it all turned out to be fun. But uh, needless to say, I'm freaking late. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be about half an hour late to Kamloops. I put out a message on my Facebook. I put out a message on my community board with YouTube. I'm hoping I haven't stood anybody up, but I'm also going to, uh, I'll never break the law. I don't break the law. Do I speed? <laughs> Come on. We'll see what time we get there at. One hour later. Well, it's uh, schmuck syndrome number three. Oh yeah, so when I stopped in Merritt, which I shouldn't have done, and then there was the traffic jam, and then I went to another one, I was all proud of myself and bragging, because I found a little 50 kilowatt, I thought I'd just give myself, you know, a little five, 10 minute juice, that'd be, I'll be totally fine. And then there was another pass that I forgot about. Yeah, another pass. So as you can see, I've got 47 kilometers of range. The charger that I'm trying to get to is 21 kilometers away. So basically uh, about 12 or 14 miles. Uh, so I'm gonna finish with about 15 miles of range. The good news is from here all the way there is downhill. Now I've been uphill all the way. So I'll probably just be fine again. But this is the second time since owning my truck since last year that I've had the little warning thing come on. We are in Kamloops. Done very well actually. We're just cruising right along, still doing 120. And we've come back out of the mountains, back into the Thompson Okanagan area. Amazingly, uh, we've gained one kilometer of range because it's downhill and we've been basically cruising all the way down the mileage distance to my location has been dropping and dropping and the needle hasn't moved uh we've been we're sitting at 47 for the past 15 10 15 uh, kilometers you know for the past 10 miles and now we've only got eight kilometers about four or five miles to go uh and we've still got the 48 so we're actually not doing that bad at all. In fact, better than the last time I went into the orange. I got a lucky. We are now slowing it down and I think we're going to just cruise right into that charger and uh, we'll go from here. I ended up having my supper early in Kamloops. So every time I 
plugged into the Electrify Canada, it went in about three or four minutes and then just stopped and said thank you and turned itself off. It's got to be something like the, uh, you know, the app with Electrify Canada. I mean, Volkswagen software is absolutely horrible in their EVs and the ID4 and the ID3. I talked to six ID4 drivers today who have four years or three years of free Electrify Canada charging included with their ID4s and they say it never works and half of them have gone off the automatic one and paid by credit card because it's so bad. So that kind of gives you an idea how good Volkswagen is at software because Volkswagen are the owners of Electrify America. Well, they're the ones that started it up after Dieselgate. I'm not quite sure how the ownership structure works now for it, but I know there's still an association because the software is complete crap. So then I went on Reddit. I mean, where else would you go, right? Go on Reddit. And I did the Substack thingy or whatever, and I'm an old lud. I don't even know what I'm doing, but I found what I was looking for, and they said, don't use the app don't use membership and don't use a debit card, use a credit card. We don't know why, but it keeps timing out with debit cards. It's like the debit card reaches a limit. Of course, it seems to be the limit's five bucks. I came into town with almost zero kilometers left on my Lightning and I needed to fill it up. So I tried it with the credit card, boom. After having my supper and getting very frustrated, I went back, plugged in, tapped it with my credit card after reading this Reddit uh, post and boom, um, charged me up to 85% and tickety-boo, I'm back on the road. Go figure. I've now decided that I'm not going home yet because I got several comments on my truck dump stops and also from a gentleman I met named Roger who often does trips up north. And this morning, when I was at the Grit Coffee Shop, if you recall, and I met Ted, and he had planned out trips up north, and he hasn't gone yet, but he said the planning was pretty scary to get up north in BC. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a northern loop in BC to see how badly I can get myself screwed. And we'll just see overall if we can start seeing more of that infrastructure we see in center and south BC happen in places like Prince George and McBride and Vail Mountain and, and, and up this area, 100 mile house. So we're just gonna go and find out by just freaking driving there. <sighs> I miss my family. I miss my dog. I miss my puppy. I miss my cat. Most importantly, I miss my love. I miss my wife. She's not with me. Why isn't she with me? Because she's smart and she knows I do stupid shit like this. And we're going to get ourselves into more crazy shit because we finished the first leg of our trucked up stop tour across British Columbia. And now the adventure begins as we head up north. We've done 1,400 kilometers together. We're going to do a lot more in the coming two days. I did take two days off to bring you a really exciting video after this tour is done. And for anybody who's trucked up, it's gonna be a whopper. Come and join me for that one. But first, we've got a long leg ahead of us, an adventure on the road. Looking forward to having you join me for part two. We'll talk to you soon.